This is a Bible study teaching by Pastor Nico Sammons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the book of Joel. The title of this message is The Day of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and that he will open our hearts so that we will understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. God has done everything he possibly can to keep you and me out of hell and still leave us as human beings with free will. In John 3 verse 16 to 17, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yet even today, some Christians argue otherwise and say that it is in fact God who sends people to hell. They say, no one would choose to go into hell. Not one person would decide to enter an eternity of flaming torment over an eternity in heavenly bliss. In Matthew chapter 7, we read that Jesus, who will sit upon the throne of his glory, will judge the hearts and minds of every living person. And Jesus will say to many on that day, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And because of this, they blame God for sending them to hell. But let me ask you a simple question this morning. When a criminal is sent to jail, we don't blame the judge, do we? We blame the criminal. The judge isn't responsible because he is just following the law. In fact, his hands or decisions are bound or tied by the law. It was the criminal who broke the law and that is why they were sent to jail. Likewise, God is bound by who he is, a holy, a loving, a righteous and just God and by his decision to give every one of us free will and then not to violate it by keeping us from making bad decisions. So, I am sure you will agree with me. It is not God who sends people to hell, but our decisions and the repercussions that these people must live with. Joel 2 verse 1 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mount. In Numbers 10 verse 1 to 2, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make these two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. So Moses is instructed here by God to make two silver trumpets and these trumpets were blown for various reasons. To break camp, to prepare for battle and to assemble the people for worship. Here in Joel chapter 2, judgment is coming, so the trumpet is blown. You will remember in Revelation chapters 8 to chapters 9, the great tribulation highlights seven trumpets. 
seven judgments and what are they called? They are called trumpet judgments. Seven trumpets blasts out judgments on the earth. They too alert the Jews to break camp and flee to the wilderness. They also sound the battle cry and they call the Jews to assemble and to turn back to their God. Joel 2 verse 2 says, A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Locust swarms had blanketed the land of Israel with thick darkness, but according to Joel, they were illustrative of a coming people, an army, that would also blanket the land in the very same way. In a sense, when we think about the prophecy of Joel, imagine the prophet wearing trifocal glasses. He sees what is immediate, then he sees a little further, and then he sees far off. In his own day, he was dealing with a plague of locust. This was the immediate danger. One hundred years into the future, the Assyrian army would invade the land of Israel, and they come from the north. We will read about this northern army a little bit later. This was the intermediate vision. But thirdly, Bible students, and we will see it in this book, Joe also speaks of the battle that will end all battles, the battle that the Bible calls the Battle of Armageddon. See Revelations 16 verse 16. Armageddon is the name of the place where the kings of the earth will assemble to do battle against God. This Hebrew name means Mountain of Megiddo, and Megiddo is a place in northern Israel. It will occur at the end of the age, and all the armies of the world will surround Jerusalem. I personally believe the book of Joel has all three of these scenarios in view. Now Joel goes on and he says in Joel 2 verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Before the plague of locusts came, the earth looked like the garden of Eden. Everything was green with rich, luxurious vegetation. The land was beautiful, but after the locusts left, there was not a bit of green to be seen. It looked as if a fire had swept over the land. The day of the Lord will be the same, in that it will be a time of great destruction. When the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride through this world, in Revelation chapter 6, there will be war, and there will be famine, and there will be death. John says in Revelation 6 verse 8, In one fell swoop, one fourth of the population on planet earth will be wiped out. And at another time in Revelation 9 verse 15, we read where another one third of earth's population will be destroyed. Joel 2 verse 4 says, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. 
Again, Joel is using the locust to describe not just the current plague in his day, but also a future army that will invade. Remember, in chapter 1 we read that the locusts had the face of a horse. In fact, one of the ancient Greek words used for locust literally means little horse. The German word for locusts means hay horse. As the horse eats hay, the locusts would eat up everything green. Joel is describing the locust plague and he is beginning to make application of it to the day of the Lord. He says, so shall they run. In other words, they move fast like leaping stallions. Joel 2 verse 5 says, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Again, these invading locusts foreshadow people in battle array, a futuristic army that is intended to come against Israel at the end of the age. Perhaps Joel even sees them in a vision. Puma helicopters, like grasshoppers. Paratroopers, floating in like a swarm. Up-to-date and prevailing artillery, overwhelming a landscape. Remember Joel mentioned four types of locust in chapter 1. It is interesting to me that the first four judgments in Revelations chapter 6 verse 1 to 8 features four horsemen, the white horse, or as we call him, the Antichrist, the red horse of war, the black horse of famine, and the pale horse, or death. Also in Revelations chapter 8 verse 6 to 12, we see seven trumpets that sound out God's judgment. The fifth trumpet is a plague of locust that rise up from the bottomless pit, from Hades. These are not ordinary locusts, for normal locusts feed on vegetation, but these locusts are ordered not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing, but to harm only those who do not have the seal of God on their heads. We are further told in Revelation 9 verse 7, and the shape of the locusts was like horses, prepared for battle. This too is similar to Joel's descriptions. In Revelation, John sees an army of locusts, like demons that harm those who are not committed to God. In Revelation chapter 9 verse 6, John says the situation will come so bad that people will long to commit suicide, but death will not be found. The situation in Joel's day and his description of it are both types of future events that still has to happen. Joel 2 verse 6 to 7 says, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. In Proverbs 30 verse 27, Solomon says, the locusts have no kin, yet go they forth, all of them by bands. In other words, the locusts do not need a king or a leader. Why? For each one knows his place, and they also come in bands. 
I hope you can see that Joel, way back here at the beginning of the writing prophets, prepares the ground for the Apostle John to come later and give the detailed description of the locusts as they will appear in the day of the Lord. When Joel writes, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. He is beginning to move from the local locust plague into the future which he has labelled the day of the Lord. They shall not break their ranks and they shall march everyone on his ways. With a chilling poetic flair, Joel describes the discipline and effectiveness of this army. Because they keep rank and because they work with energy, for they run to and fro in the city, they bring a shattering attack on Judah. If we consider the people of God to be like an army, Perhaps based on the military images Paul sprinkled through his letters, then this passage shows us two things that can make God's people, you and you and me, more effective. First, they must keep order with every soldier keeping ranks. Second, they must work hard with every soldier serving with energy. In the next verse, we will see that Joel is talking about the day of the Lord. Joel 2 verse 8 to 9 says, Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Sounds to me like the demons in Revelation chapter 9. Listen people, verse 8 says, You cannot destroy these locusts and you cannot kill them or keep them out. Let us read Revelation chapter 9 verse 5 to 8 together to see what is happening here. And to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now notice this description of the locusts in verse 7 to 8. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the thief of lions. This is an unusual type of locust. This plague will take place during the Great Tribulation. This little prophet Joel, who has been largely ignored by most believers, sheds a great deal of light on the last days, which he calls the Day of the Lord. Joel 2 verse 10 says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. 
Again, see the comparisons in Revelation chapter 8 verse 12, when the fourth trumpet blasts, a third of the sun, moon and stars refuse to shine. In Revelation 6 verse 12, when the sixth seal is broken, the sky rolls up like a scroll. In Revelation 16 verse 17, when the seventh bowl is poured, an enormous earthquake strikes. We can only imagine the terrible events these plagues describe. Obviously, John and Joe agree that in the end, the day of the Lord, the earth and everything in it will go nuts. Mother Earth will have a serious case of PMS, post-menstrual syndrome. Joel 2 verse 11 says, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? The Lord gives voice before his army. As impressive as this army is, Joel does not want Judah to forget that its real power lies in that which God has sent them. This army will be God's tool of judgment against Judah, unless they repent. When the plague of locusts and the drought shattered Judah, you might have thought that Joel would encourage his people. He might have said, hang in there guys and girls, things are bad, but don't worry, it will get better. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Instead, Joel said, you think that was bad, worse is yet to come if you don't repent. This is what Jesus said about the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 22. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, that refers to the Jews, those days will be shortened. Joel 2, verse 12 to 13 says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rent your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knows, Bible students, if God will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him. The day of the Lord. This term matches to an Old Testament phrase referring to God or His Messiah breaking into history to set up the new age of righteousness. In the Old Testament, God's coming could be for blessing or for judgment. For believers, it will be the culmination of salvation, i.e. resurrection. But for unbelievers, the consummation of judgment. In the Old Testament, the writer saw two ages, an evil age and a coming age of righteousness. The age of the Holy Spirit. God would intervene in history through His Son, Jesus Christ, to set up this new age. This event is known as the Day of the Lord. Notice also that New Testament writers attribute this to Jesus Christ, Jesus' birth, and his incarnation was foretold or prophesied in many Old Testament texts. The Jews did not expect a divine person, they only expected a divine intervention. 
the two comings of Jesus, one as a suffering servant and Savior, and one as judge and Lord, were not obvious to the Old Testament prophets and people. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study? Number one. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, we read that when Jesus descends to rapture us, He will call us with a voice like that of a trumpet. Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9 talks about trumpet judgments against the rebellious people who have rejected God's Son instead of responding to His goodness. In our day, the trumpet speaks of our being called up and of judgment coming down. In Joel's day, it spoke of coming together and seeking the Lord. Number two, the day of the locust is a dark day indeed. Those who have experienced this kind of invasion of locusts tell us that the sun cannot even be seen until the locusts are killed, fly to another location, or are blown away by the wind. This darkness also speaks to us. However, because sometimes that is the way our lives feel, gloomy and dark, to the point where we don't even want to face a new day. Listen, Bible students, life is not always easy. There are sad times, there are struggles, but don't short-circuit them, because those times will make you rich in heaven. It's all about eternity. Don't lose sight of that. There are bigger issues than comfort and ease and freedom from pain. Be wise in these last days. Number three, Revelation chapter 9 describes what will happen in the day of the Lord and the tribulation. Locusts will be released from the bottomless pit, but they will be unique in that they will be instructed to harm only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The people on earth who will still reject God even in the day of the tribulation, when they should be turning to God. Why should they turn to God, you ask? Because of the witness you and I, we leave behind. Because of the testimony of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will preach the gospel. Because of the angel flying through the sky, preaching because of the two witnesses, most likely Elijah and Moses, who come on the scene preaching and doing lots and lots of miracles. Those who reject all of this will be attacked by locusts that strike like a scorpion. Number four, Jesus talking about the end times to his followers, minimized near future and far future events, as did the Old Testament prophets. Many of these events have already occurred. More are yet to come. But God is in control of even the length of any tribulations and persecutions. He will not forget his people. Now I am sure that some of you might be thinking, Pastor Niku, I don't like hearing about this. I don't even want to think about it. Well, to be honest, me neither. But I am not doing you any favors by avoiding this message. That would be like a doctor that would not tell his patient to change their lifestyle or that you are going to die young. For, you see, how can we share God's truth and not share the whole truth? Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying we should chase after people, waving our Bibles in the air and shouting to them, 
turn or burn, or you're on your way to hell. Yet, there are some people that need to hear that hell is real and it is eternal. We need to warn people that there are consequences of not accepting Jesus Christ. The tribulation that is coming is real, but God is righteous and just. So will you please sound the alarm? In Revelation 22 verse 12, Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Number five. In the Old Testament days, people would tear their clothes as a sign of deep sorrow. But the Lord is saying an outward show does not change the inward reality. Don't go through the outward motions of church and spirituality. He says, come before me with brokenness. Number six. One of Satan's greatest achievements has been to convince the world that God is just waiting to judge people in any way, at any time, for anything he can. But as we have seen in this Bible study, nothing could be farther from the truth. He is, in fact, looking for any way possible not to judge people, showing patience and mercy to generations. I want to conclude Job part 3 with this thought. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins, hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision to follow and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Please give us a call at 082-828-2085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ. I will continue this Bible study teaching on the book of Joel next time, so be sure to join us again.